What is art without the muse? Many of Western art's most famous works are depictions of women. But who were these women? Do they have their own stories to share with the world? Hello and welcome to Art Muse, a podcast that aims to reshape the ways in which we interpret well-known works of art by paying dues to the women whose images have been immortalized, but whose names and stories have been wrongfully overlooked. While these women's faces are familiar to viewers around the world, their identities have been largely forgotten. Together we will explore the important lives and legacy of the female muse and appreciate these works of art from a new perspective, through the eyes of the women whose image stares back at us. Is the muse in actuality just as, if not more, important than the artists themselves? And I'm your host, Grace Anna. Gustav Klimt's The Kiss is one of the world's most treasured works of art. Viewers flock annually to Vienna's Gallery Belvedere to take in Klimt's masterpiece. Reproductions of the painting adorn college dorm rooms, and as of recent, The Kiss has been the subject of a large immersive exhibition in New York City. The Kiss has come to embody love and romanticism. It depicts an intimate moment between a man and a woman, two lovers suspended in time within a brilliant gold background, and a kiss being bestowed upon the cheek of a woman. What many viewers may not know is that the woman in Klimt's wondrous work is in fact a real woman from history, with her own name and story to share. Listeners, I'd like to introduce you to Emily Fluga, a Viennese fashion designer, independent businesswoman, forward-thinking creative, and the most important person in Gustav Klimt's life. She is pictured in the kiss with Klimt himself, who holds her head as he gently kisses her cheek. Soulmates, creative partners, best friends. It's hard to define the relationship between Klimt and Emily, as is the line of Muse vs. Artist. In many ways, Emily and Klimt were each other's muses, continually inspiring each other's creations. Emily and Klimt's love for one another was a love in its purest form and embodied the idealism of a now lost world. Vienna before Hitler's invasion and the fall of the Austrian-Hungarian Empire. In this kiss, we get a glimpse of the boundless love between Emily and Klimt, the power of their creative partnership, and Vienna's dawn before its darkest day. So let's dive in. Emily Louise Fluga was born on August 30th, 1874, in the suburbs of Vienna. She came from a family of artisan roots. Her grandfather immigrated to Vienna from Hanover and was a successful master woodturner. Her father, Hermann Fluga, expanded the business and became a prominent Meerschaum smoking pipe manufacturer. His smoking pipes were not only sold in Vienna, but internationally, especially popular in England, which attests to the scope and success of his business. Her mother, Barbara Fluga, came from a craftsman family. Both creativity and handicraft evidently ran through Emily's veins, and she would have learned the importance of skillful artisanship early on. We get a sense of Emily's father's spirit from Klimt's brother, Ernst, who painted Emily's father in 1892. We see a robust man, strong and confident, and dressed in a way that makes his affluence palpable. Klimt himself would many years later paint Emily's father on his deathbed, a breathtaking and intimate portrait of an old man dying. The two portraits work together to give us a personal look into Emily's father at both his life's peak and later his life's end. While Klimt painted Emily's mother as a spectator of an early genre scene, The most noteworthy portrait of Barbara Fluga is actually also in her late age. In his Portrait of Barbara Fluga, Klimt painted Emily's mother at age 75, seated with her hands folded, garbed in black, and set against a vibrant green background. 
Barbara has a warm smile and welcomeness about her that gives us a sense of her sweet demeanor. These portraits provide insight into the character of Emily's parents, who shaped Emily into the woman she was to become. But back to Emily's childhood. Emily was the youngest of four children, with an elder brother and two elder sisters. Despite being female, the three sisters would have received a traditional education, which included language courses, needlework, and learning to play the piano. Emily's elder sisters trained as seamstresses, and Emily would have learned the trade as a young girl. In fact, her older sister Pauline set up an educational establishment to train dressmakers, an impressive feat for a young woman, which Emily attended and became involved with. At the time of Emily's birth, Klimt was already a 12-year-old boy. While we can safely assume that the Fluga and Klimt families were familiarized with each other for some time, Gustav Klimt was formally introduced to the Fluga family when his younger brother Ernst married Emily's sister Helene in 1891. Ernst was also a painter who specialized in history paintings. Sadly, after the birth of their baby girl and only 15 months into their marriage, Ernst passed away at the age of 29 from inflammation of the heart. Leaving behind Helen and a newborn baby girl, Gustav Klimt stepped in as guardian to take care of mother and daughter. As guardian, Klimt would have been welcomed into the Fluga family and frequented their home. It is here that the 30-year-old Klimt became acquainted with the then 17-year-old Emily. We can imagine that Emily, a young, aspiring seamstress with a thirst for creativity, began to look up to the older Klimt, who by this time was well on his way to becoming an established painter. Yet despite her youth, it is evident that Klimt began to look up to the young Emily as well. We get our first glimpses into the burgeoning friendship between Klimt and Emily from a few of Klimt's paintings from this time, which feature Emily. In the same year that they met, Klimt painted a pastel portrait of Emily titled Emily Fluga, age 17. In fact, the work is one of Klimt's first portraits ever, already sensing in Emily an opportunity for artistic exploration. Emily is pictured in profile with a dreamy expression. Her hair is pinned back with a fashionable tiara and she wears a white dress. Her youthful beauty exudes a sense of innocence, and at the same time she feels quite ethereal. There seems to be a sense of distance between viewer and sitter, and subsequently artist and sitter. In this work, we sense Klimt's shy observation of Emily. The first moments when Klimt and Emily began acquainting themselves with each other and perhaps Klimt's longing to better understand Emily. We have to wonder, did Klimt know that this girl would soon become the most important person in his life? The creative spark that fueled his career and the woman he would one day kiss in his most famous work. We find Emily in another work by Klimt a few years later. Ernst had begun a fresco titled The Harlequin at the Fair in Rothenburg, but died before it was completed. Just as Gustav jumped in to raise his child, he also stepped in artistically to bring his brother's unfinished works into fruition and completed the work in 1892. The painting depicts a stage clown with a crowd of spectators. It was often the most economically savvy choice to use family members as the models for larger genre scenes. And Ernst did so, painting Emily, her sisters, and her mother into the crowd. Yet where Emily's figure was obscured and off to the side in Ernst's earlier version, Gustav moved Emily to the front center of the canvas. And here we see the young Emily, clad in a white lace cap and elegant dress, looking up rosy-cheeked at the Harlequin. She is the central observer. The small but meaningful change could be our first peek into Klimt's growing admiration for Emily. And just as he moved her figure to the center of the fresco, 
she quickly became the center of his life. Just a few years later, by 1897, Emma Lee and Klimt became inseparable. They took up French lessons together, attended the theater side by side, spent summer vacations with each other, and simultaneously began exploring their own creative practices. In 1903, when the Wiener Werkstatt, Viennese Workshops, an alliance of forward-thinking artists and designers was founded, both Emily and Klimt became members. Emily and Klimt were coming into themselves as artists at a unique time in Western history. Vienna, at the turn of the 20th century, was in the midst of an artistic, intellectual, and scientific renaissance. It was a time of revolutionary thought and the embrace of bohemian lifestyle, and Vienna became the epicenter for cultural progression. Vienna was home to pivotal composers like Schoenberg and Schubert, and a century before Mozart, who transformed classical music. Vienna was also the birthplace of modern psychology, where Sigmund Freud founded psychoanalysis and wrote works on the human psyche that forever changed human history. What makes this time all the more significant is that it survived less than 50 years before it came crashing down. It was a fleeting moment in history, a short-lived but indispensable period of free thinking and creation that fostered some of the most important figures of modern history. A New York Times article from 1990 described this time as, quote, the brilliant sunset of Vienna in its final glory. Emily and Klimt as artists and individuals would not have been able to thrive in the ways they did had they been born a century before or after. Their art was of this special time and would later come to embody the ethereal glory of a lost world. Perhaps it was their destiny to be part of this sunset before the darkness were to come. Around the time that Emily and Klimt joined the Wiener Werkstatt, Emily and her sisters, after many years of training, received their first fashion commission. The task was to design outfits for a cookery competition. Their designs were so well received that they won a large contract and garnered the attention of the Viennese aristocracy. Soon after, in 1904, Emily and her two sisters opened their own fashion salon called Schwestern Fluga, the Fluga Sisters. The salon was located in the Rag Trade District in what was known as the Casa Piccola building, named after the popular coffee house on the ground floor. The space was large enough to also accommodate a private apartment for the three sisters, who lived together with Emily's mother and niece. As we will see, Emily would live and work in this building uninterrupted for the next 34 years of her life. The salon opened when Emily was 31 years old. That three single women, one widowed and two unmarried, opened a business of their own was quite remarkable for the time. This brave initiative by the three independent sisters mirrored their forward-thinking designs. Spearheaded by Emma Lee, the salon specialized in the reform dress, a new progressive dress made for the new modern woman. Rebelling against the restrictive clothing that women wore for centuries, such as corsets, bodices, and girdles. The reform dress's free-flowing design was meant to liberate women's bodies, both physically and metaphorically. Drawing influence from peasant smocks, kimonos, and galabeas, these dresses had wide sleeves, empty waists, and were long and billowing, allowing for unrestricted movement. They weren't designed for men to objectify women's bodies, but rather put forward the notion that men and women were equal partners. The physical emancipation of the female body that the reform dress allowed for expressed the larger societal need for liberation of women. The dresses were designed for and designed by strong and confident women. The reform dress, as well as the Svester and Fluga, became a symbol of female independence and would pave the way for other designers like Coco Chanel with a similar mission of liberation through female fashion. It wasn't just the salon's dress designs that were avant-garde, but the salon's interior itself. 
Emily commissioned architects Josef Hoffman and Coleman Moser of the Wiener Werkstatt to design the salon, turning the space into an aesthetic masterpiece in and of itself. The salon in its entirety was reduced to black and white, and all of the furniture was abstracted into squares and rectangles. The floors of the salon were covered wall to wall with gray felt, which not only accentuated the muted color palette, but would have been comfortable for customers to walk barefoot on while they were being fitted for Emily's creations. Customers entered the salon into a stunning reception room with abstracted chairs for them to sit upon. The reception led into a showroom with vitrines exhibiting samples of Emily's designs, followed by a mannequin room and three changing rooms all equipped with adjustable mirrors. In fact, there were even secret cupboards behind the mirrored walls. On the back end, there were at least three cutting rooms, as well as an office where the sisters and their accountant would conduct their business. The salon's aesthetic style was consistent through the salon's entirety, down to the signage and dress labels. The salon was not just a place of business, but was an immersive artistic experience yet another way in which Emily and her salon were revolutionary. The muted colors of the interior would have made the ideal backdrop for Emily's exquisite designs to stand out marvelously, attracting the Viennese elite. The Schwestern Fluga catered to the creme de la creme of Viennese society, and many of the city's wealthiest and most influential women of the time frequented the salon. The dresses were expensive, at least four times more expensive than department store dresses, and only the well-off could afford Emily's unique designs. Their clientele was so impressive that the dresses were sold internationally, even selling to the Rothschilds. The salon was not only a place to purchase custom-made extravagant gowns, but became a place of gathering for high society women. And it wasn't just a meeting place for women, but the salon was actually where Klimt picked up some of his most important commissions. You may even recognize some of these women as the subject of Klimt's best works. Garbed in Emily's designs, nonetheless. But we'll get into this in more detail later on. I do want to also note for now that the majority of these women were from Jewish aristocratic families. This will be important to our story later on, as Hitler's invasion of Vienna was just on the horizon. While they wouldn't know it at the time, the world the Salon existed in and was striving for would come shortly after crashing down. A fleeting, beautiful moment of creativity, female liberation, and religious freedom. The shop ran until 1938, for 34 consecutive years, as we will later see even surviving the Great Depression, the salon was so successful that the sisters were able to afford a cook, housemaid, and chauffeur for their living quarters. At its height, the salon employed up to 80 seamstresses, three cutters, a bookkeeper, and at least one model. Schwester and Fluga not only represented a new form of fashion, but was at the forefront of shaping it. The unique designs made specifically for the person intended to wear them were artworks in and of themselves and celebrated women in their fullness, in their strength, in their magic. The salon's success was largely due to Emily's immense talent and artistic vision. Emily was the creative force of the trio, while the sisters took on a more managerial role. It was Emily's genius that turned the dresses into one-of-a-kind masterpieces, and it was Emily, with her needle, that carved a path towards emancipation, one dress at a time. Herta Vanke, an employee of Svestern Fluga, remembered of her time working there, quote, It was Emily in particular who kept the salon going. It was due only to her initiative that the firm reached such a height. I was particularly fascinated with how busy she was, how industrious. She was the one first in the morning to give instructions on cutting, and then she worked like an artist, like a sculptor at the mannequin. In this way, she pinned the dress and she clearly enjoyed it. Emily was really the artistic director and creative force of the salon. 
And it wasn't just her talent, but also her drive and networking that allowed it to be as successful as it was. Emily traveled to Paris twice a year to attend trade shows and be in conversation with other designers, trips that are well documented. We know with certainty that she was in communication with Coco Chanel, who was just beginning at that time. While Coco Chanel has become a household name, few know that Emily's shop actually opened four years before Coco Chanel's, and that Emily's work paved the way for the young designer. While the reform dress was becoming popular at the time throughout Europe, Emily really elevated the reform dress to what is called the art dress, the reform dress in its highest expression. These dresses were not just inspired by art, but they themselves were art. It was quite revolutionary at the time to see a dress in the same light as one would a painting. And in being respected not just as a designer, but as an artist, Emily was liberating herself as an independent creator. Emily as a designer was greatly influenced by Hungarian and Slavic traditional peasant costumes. Emily, Klimt, and other avant-garde artists at the time were turning to European folk cultures for inspiration. These artists recognized the brilliance in folk art simplicity and colorful design. We see this in Klimt's work, his vibrant color palette and two-dimensionality. We also see this in Emily's dresses, melting the shape of the reform dress with colorful motifs inspired by folk tradition. Emily also built an impressive collection of Slavic and Hungarian costumes and materials, which she displayed behind glass cases at the salon. In fact, more than 200 individual pieces were found in her estate, a collection impressive enough for a museum. Emily would thoughtfully select and rotate her collection on display. In this way, Emily was not only a designer and artist, but a collector and curator, and her salon was not just home to her business and creations, but a place dedicated to the celebration of art and creativity in all forms, from the space's design to the art displayed. And all this time that Emily was running her salon, creating her revolutionary dresses, and fostering a community of forward-thinking women, she had Klimt by her side, and she by his. For over 20 years, Emily and Klimt shared almost every aspect of their lives with each other, supporting each other's artistic careers, co-collaborating on fashion designs, frequenting the theater, sharing summers in Upper Austria, where they spent 16 consecutive seasons together, and sharing with each other family and friends. Klimt lived near Emily and would frequently pop in and out of Emily's salon, notorious for dropping paper hats onto the surprised heads of the coffee house's customers below. The two made a funny pair. Emily was significantly taller than Klimt, who had to look up to meet her eye. We can picture the two of them, arm in arm, Klimt garbed in an artist's smock, and Emily in one of her reform dresses, strolling down the streets of Vienna, discussing their next act of artistic rebellion. We get the majority of primary information on Emily and Klimt's unique relationship from the almost 400 surviving postcards that Klimt sent to Emily over the span of their 20-year-long relationship. The postcards were discovered 30 years after Emily's death, as part of Emily's estate. The letters survived two world wars, the collapse of the Austrian-Hungarian Empire, the closing of the Schwestern Fluga, a fire in Emily's apartment, and Emily's own death. They were found in 1981 in neat bundles tied with blue ribbons, preserved as Emily herself must have kept them and cherished them. The postcards themselves aren't grandiose, no lengthy and dramatic declarations of love. Rather, by and large, the postcards are rare snippets into the small details of Emily and Klimt's everyday life that may have otherwise been forgotten. Klimt writes to Emily of the weather, of his hangovers after nights out, of his artistic projects, of the little sparrows in his garden, and of the ups and downs of his mental health. He invites Emily to the opera or on long walks together in the spring, continues the conversations that they had had that day, 
and pleads to Emily to return to Vienna from her annual business trips to Paris. Their love may not be obvious from the letters' language, as there are no outward words suggesting intimacy, but rather in the frequency with which Klimt wrote to Emily. He once wrote Emily eight postcards in one day, in the small doodles he scribbled within his notes, and in the little details that one would only share with their closest confidant and companion. The letters make clear that Emily was the light of Klimt's days, the one he shared his most private of thoughts, the one he missed most when they were apart, and the one who shared in his unique creative visions. As scholar Wolfgang Fischer wrote of Klimt's letters to Emily, quote, he could not live without communicating with her. And this feels very true. The letters detail their shared language lessons, which Klimt often missed, that they went to the theater six times together in one year alone, that Klimt visited Emily when she was ill and went on a health retreat, and that Klimt dreamt of Emily on his trips to Spain. The mutual respect in their relationship is palpable reading Klimt's letters. They paint the picture of Klimt and Emily as independent artists and individuals who shared the journey of life together in a way that did not compromise their respective freedom. Unfortunately, not a single written correspondence from Emily to Klimt has survived. Not a single word. The letters, while an incredible window into Emily and Klimt's relationship, are thus one-sided. We are left having to imagine Emily's responses. Did Emily also write to Klimt several times a day? Did she doodle along the sides of the postcards or share details of her trips to London and Paris? Did she tell Klimt that she dreamt of him too? Though we cannot know Emily's voice through her letters, we do feel Emily's spirit and how she related to Klimt from surviving photographs. Quite a few photographs of Emily exist the most famous of which are a group of 20 photographs of Emily taken by Klimt in 1906 for the Journal of the German Arts and Crafts. The photo was published as advertisements for the salon. In the photos, Emily models dresses co-designed by Emily and Klimt and produced at Emily's salon. The dresses are reform art dresses with high collars, flowy sleeves, and playful patterns. We see before us a beautiful and confident woman standing proudly, wearing the dresses they collaborated on. There also survives incredible photographs of Emily and Klimt together, taken during their shared summer vacations on Lake Attersea. One, taken in 1909, captures Emily and Klimt on a rowboat. Klimt is seated, oars in hand, navigating the waters, as Emily balances herself to stand. She wears a kimono-like floral dress with billowing sleeves that obscure her hands. Emily greets the camera with a broad smile and has a childlike playfulness to her. Caught in a genuine moment of joy, Emily, quite simply, is enjoying life. As the photographs and letters show, Emily and Klimt were creative beings who enjoyed exploring the world through artistic means together. They immersed themselves in theater and music, were co-members of an avant-garde artistic group, observed the natural world with one another, and shared a passion for folk art. And not only did they co-collaborate on designs, but they continuously inspired and supported each other's respective careers for over two decades. We see the influence of Emily in all of Klimt's best works. The bold colors, the patterned backgrounds reminiscent of textiles, the vibrant and dazzling clothing that his subjects wear. And, in fact, the subjects themselves. It was Emily who introduced Klimt to the wealthy patrons of her salon and encouraged them to commission a portrait by Klimt. And it was Emily's dresses that these women were forever immortalized in. One such woman was Adele Block Bauer, whose portrait by Klimt later became the focal point of an international legal dispute and the subject of the film Woman in Gold. It was Emily who introduced Adele to Klimt, and it was Emily's dress that Adele is eternalized in. 
while Emily provided Klimt clients. In return, his paintings acted as brilliant advertisements for the salon. Klimt's featuring of Emily's designs was an ode to the woman behind his greatest works and a show of his solidarity with the feminist movement she was at the forefront of. Fashion dominates the paintings from the peak of Klimt's career, and Emily's influence is the heart and soul of these works. And then, of course, there are Klimt's masterpieces that feature Emily in the flesh. In 1902, at the age of 28, and shortly before Emily opened her salon, Klimt painted a full-length portrait of Emily. She stands confidently, with her hand on her waist, making direct eye contact with the viewer. Her curly hair is untamed and free, emphasizing her natural beauty. She is garbed in an intricate and beautifully patterned reform dress that she herself designed. Around her head, Klimt has placed a colorful halo of sorts, encasing her in a bubble of creativity. The portrait is Klimt's homage to Emily, as both an artist and woman. She is majestic, goddess-like, larger than life, and self-assured. She proudly wears her own design, as if to say, I'm ready to change the world, one dress at a time. Interestingly, Emily and her family rejected Klimt's portrait of Emily. The painting was sold in 1908 and transferred to Vienna's Historical Museum, where it remains today. While the painting's sale and subsequent rejection by Emily is referenced in Klimt's letters to Emily, we do not know why Emily rejected the painting. What was it about the portrait that Emily disliked? Was it her likeness? The composition? Her expression? Unfortunately, this is one of the many open-ended questions we have about Emily, who retains the same prowess and mystique as she does in her portrait. Luckily, this was not the last work of Klimt's that Emily is featured in. A few years after Klimt painted Emily's portrait, Klimt forever enshrined Emily in his now most famous work, The Kiss. Klimt painted his treasured masterpiece between 1907 and 1908, at the height of both his and Emily's artistic careers. The painting, a perfect square, is life-size, measuring almost six by six feet. In the kiss, we see Klimt and Emily upon a bed of flowers. Klimt stands while Emily kneels on her knees, a small allude to Emily's taller height. The figures are set against a Byzantine gold background, suspending them in time and space. They are both dressed in what we can imagine are Emily's designs. Klimt's robe, decorated with gray, black, and white rectangles, is reminiscent of the minimalist design of Emily's salon. And Emily is clad in a colorful, free-flowing dress that evokes the folk art that they both loved. They seem to be encased within a golden aura, a holy container where only they exist. And, of course, the painting captures Klimt bestowing a kiss upon Emily's cheek, who turns to us in this moment of intimacy, eyes closed, as she receives Klimt's act of adoration. It is a moment of mutual affection and abandon, a moment of love in its purest form, frozen in time. There is an innocence in their kiss, a kiss without obvious sexual connotations, a kiss that could be between lovers, friends, soulmates, life partners, and co-creators. It is a love without parameters or consequence, a kiss that could mean everything and nothing at once. The kiss is devoid of any narrative and context. As scholar Gottfried Fliedel describes, there is a, quote, ambiguous preciousness within the work that places Emily and Klimt within their own special world. It is a world that's theirs and that we are not a part of. The ambiguity is not unlike the elusivity of their relationship at large. While there is no doubt of Emily and Klimt's love for one another and the significant impact that they left on each other's artistic careers, 
Scholars have attempted to define the exact nature of Emily and Klimt's relationship for decades. Was their relationship platonic or romantic? Were Emily and Klimt secret lovers or just lifelong companions? And what is the meaning of the kiss that Klimt bestowed upon Emily? What details of their lives survive do not provide a clear answer. Although they shared their lives together, Emily and Klimt never married. There's no record of Emily ever having any other romantic relationships. While Klimt had known affairs with some of his models, he also never married, and Emily was by and large the most consistent and important relationship in his life. There have been numerous theories put forth by scholars, many admittedly quite sexist, in regards to the duo's relationship status. To me, the most infuriating theory of the many out there is that Emily, in love with Klimt and desperately wishing to marry him, settled for the role of friend and supporter. The theory completely robs Emily of any agency in the course of her own life and in their relationship, and belittles Emily's many brave accomplishments. Would the woman behind revolutionary dresses meant to liberate the female body and spirit really settle for a subordinate role to please a man? Or rather, might Emily not have wanted to get married herself? Marriages came with restrictions, and she likely would have had to give up her career if she became a wife. Remaining unmarried gave Emily financial independence and the ability to support herself as she shaped the life she wanted to lead. Emily, who spent her career pushing past the limiting boundaries of female fashion, likely equally did not believe in the limiting constitution of marriage and what it meant for women of her time. What seems far more likely is that Emily and Klimt, two forward-thinking artists, chose to lead their own free lives together. They were equal artistic companions, advocates of each other's careers, partners who turned to each other to share the day-to-day of their lives, and in many ways each other's muses. And just as their respective art was revolutionary and embodied the progressiveness of the time, so was their relationship. As scholar Ruth Millington so beautifully put it, quote, Klimt and Fluga, in a process of co-creation, became standard bearers of the new liberated man and woman, the alternative king and queen of fashionable Viennese society. The love between Klimt and Emily escapes the obvious and remains an enigma. It is a love free of definition and complete understanding. It is a love hidden in the lines of Klimt's letters, captured in the way Klimt takes his photos of Emily, painted into Klimt's most glorious works, and a secret whispered as Klimt pecks Emily in the kiss. Klimt ended the last surviving postcard to Emily with a note saying, quote, I should like to get away. While Klimt was referring to leaving Vienna for the countryside, he would unexpectedly die of a stroke just six months later, on February 6, 1918, at the age of 56. On his deathbed, his final words were, Send for Emily. Emily was 44 years old when her life companion passed away. Emily was so important in Klimt's life that she was mentioned in his obituary, despite not being formally his spouse. Along with his two sisters, Emily inherited Klimt's estate and dedicated the rest of her life to preserving and protecting his legacy. Emily spent an entire year after his death cleaning Klimt's studio. At the salon, Emily created what was referred to as the Klimt Room, a room where Emily kept Klimt's art, furniture from his studio, and some of Klimt's most treasured possessions, and a place she could honor the memory of her greatest life companion. An employee of Schwestern Fluga recalled, quote, I also had the privilege of being taken regularly to her holiest of holies, the Klimt Room and being permitted to dust there, tidy up, and so on. While I did that, Emily opened the cases and shook out and aired the beautiful Chinese and Japanese silk garments. I was allowed to dust the folders of drawings, 
there were original drawings by Klimt in the drawers, which she put back with great care so that nothing should happen to them. What did Emily do in the moment she visited the Klimt room on her own? Did she reread the painter's letters to her? Sit on the chairs that had once adorned his studio? Brush her hands against the drawings that Klimt once made with his own hand? Did she continue to share her life with Klimt? Whispers she made during the after hours of her salon, hoping that her lost companion could still hear her on the other side. Despite her mourning, Emily continued to run the Schwestern Fluga, which not only survived World War I, the fall of the Habsburg monarchy, and the Great Depression, but actually thrived during this time. The salon's continued success, despite international war and economic crisis, attests to Emily's savviness in business, as well as the loyalty and wealth of her customers. In 1932, at the height of the Depression, Emily still employed 20 seamstresses and two cutters, a sizable team given the circumstances. Emily and her sisters were able to adjust to a new world and changing times without compromising their professional integrity and the quality of their product. Unfortunately, the resilience of the Schwestern Fluga was no match for what was to come. On March 12, 1938, Hitler marched into Vienna and forcibly annexed Austria into the German Reich. The sun of the cultural and artistic progression had finally set, and a great darkness had descended. The Nazis viewed Schwestern Fluga as a symbol of aristocratic decadence, and after 34 prosperous years, the salon was forced to close. Emily and her sisters tried to sell the beautiful furnishings and special made objects that decorated the salon for decades, but they were deemed worthless. Emily took with her her folk costume collection and a few small items originally belonging to Klimt. The salon and apartment were demolished and with it the life that Emily once knew and the sisters were forced to relocate. The Nazis not only viewed the salon as representative of an aristocratic elite, but specifically as a place with ties to the Jewish upper middle class. The majority of the salon's clients were of wealthy Jewish families. These were the same women forever captured in Klimt's masterpieces who were now fleeing for their lives. And in fact, some were not so fortunate. We know that at least one of the subjects of Klimt's portraits, Amelie Zuckerkandl, was murdered along with her daughter in a concentration camp. Emily lost her most important customers in the most devastating sense of the word and was left to grieve the lives of the women who most supported Emily and Klimt throughout their careers. In many ways, Klimt's portraits of these Jewish patrons not only preserve a world that no longer exists, but the women who Hitler tried to erase from it, forever memorialized in Emily's best dresses. Emily relocated to a new apartment in Vienna, where she attempted to rebuild her life in an unrecognizable world. She continued to work from her top floor of her new home, although she was never able to regain the success she once had. In the final days of World War II, in 1945, her apartment caught fire and destroyed the majority of her belongings, including much of her garment collection and many of her treasured items from Klimt. We can only imagine how devastating this fire must have been for Emily as she watched the last remnants of her relationship with Klimt and her life from a vanished world go up in flames. Emily, with the items of her past that she could salvage, lived a solitary life for the next seven years until she died on May 26, 1952, at the age of 77 from kidney failure. She was buried in the Fluga family vault at the cemetery in the 11th district of Vienna, in a soon forgotten grave only recently rediscovered in 2006. She was among the last survivors from a completely vanished world. A world that she and Klimt once explored excitedly together. 
a world in which she fought for female liberation through her dress designs, a world that now only exists within a painted kiss. Unfortunately, only a handful of Emily's dresses still exist today. Thanks to the discovery of her estate in 1981, historians have been able to preserve Emily's surviving belongings. The estate contained all of Klimt's letters to Emily, a few of her unfinished designs, her remaining textile collection, the photo album containing the fashion photographs that Klimt took of Emily, and jewelry that Klimt had custom-made for Emily from the Wiener Werkstatt. These items survived against all odds and were with Emily in her last days. They remind us of the resilience of Emily's spirit and of the undying love between her and Klimt. While Klimt has become one of the most famous artists of our time, Emily has unfairly fallen into relative obscurity. My hope is that this episode can be one of many initiatives to share Emily's forgotten legacy. The next time you look at Klimt's The Kiss, remember Emily as the fashion designer on the forefront of the fight for female liberation, even preceding Coco Chanel. As the youngest of three sisters who as single women ran their own successful business for over 30 years. As a woman who not only inspired, but made possible Klimt's best masterpieces. And as a woman of resilience who remained in her city through its darkest days. The kiss that Klimt bestows upon Emily is just as fleeting as the world that they lived in. In this kiss, time is suspended, and we are, just for a heartbeat, allowed to witness a magical moment in time, not just in Emily and Klimt's lives, but in a world that no longer exists. Experts have been asking the wrong question in regards to Emily and Klimt. Instead of the constant deliberation over the nature of their relationship, the real question is, how can we allow Emily and Klimt's love to challenge our limiting understanding of what love can be? Instead of trying to fit their relationship into a box, Emily and Klimt remind us that the truest love cannot be contained or defined. Maybe we're not meant to understand the love between Emily and Klimt. Maybe their love was theirs and theirs alone. And we are lucky enough to witness just one small kiss. I hope you have enjoyed this episode on Emily Fluga. I have included images, resources, and suggestions for further reading on the Art Muse website and Instagram. Art Muse is produced by Kula Production Company. Today's episode was written by me, your host, Grace Anna. Stay tuned as I continue to share the stories of the women behind some of the world's most important works of art. Until next time, bye for now. <laughs>